Tonight, Jason McLean and myself will be considering the cult classic from Louis Powell and Jacques Berger, The Morning of the Magicians. The book offers a heady blend of thought experiments and historical reimaginings, laced with tales of ancient civilizations and occult Nazi conspiracies, and it culminates in hints and predictions of a mystical future, one populated by advanced mutants that might already live among us and where science is indistinguishable from magic. It paved the way for a wide range of new age beliefs and pop culture motives so tonight jason and i will be considering again the morning of the magicians Hey, mate. How you doing? Oh, so far, so good. What about yourself? Good. It's Tuesday's always crazy chaos because I have my daughter's homeschool community day, and we got major snow here for the first time in Wisconsin. Oh, really? So we, it's an hour away. So driving, there's cars in ditches and accidents yeah. everywhere. And you're like, ah, somebody from Sydney. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm kind of used to it now because I've been driving it for you know, half a dozen years, but yeah. it's still a little nerve wracking when you weren't raised in snowy icy road conditions i guess oh i i can imagine every we get two weeks of really like it's finally gotten cold here like it just went from like 80s and 90s to now we're in the 40s pretty regularly um because it's how texas works we just we're hot until you're not like that's just how we go um but it, it'll it'll fluctuate a little bit but we get two weeks of real cold like that's it we get the two weeks one solid week is you somewhere between mid-december through the end of january will be cold and icy yeah really it's, it's two weeks but one week solid will just be frozen and then we go back to normal that's that's how we roll so during that one week most people just sort of pack up and just stay put but trust me i know what you're talking about you, when you do have to go out people who just don't know how to drive on it like they just you'll just see these cars and you're like okay it's like for some reason, like, well, I might as well just go my normal speed. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, I know, or my favorite one is it's usually not the people who don't know how to, it's the people who think they know how to drive yeah, on ice. Like, well, I'm from right. Oklahoma or I'm from Wisconsin. Kansas, Wisconsin. I'm from Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's like, guys, you're in Texas. We don't get snow, we get ice. That's it. And I don't care how long you've been driving on snow, you can't drive on ice because friction is still a thing. Yeah, and it's a terrifying thing when you're in the middle of a snowstorm and your visibility is low and the roads are... Anyway. Oh, yeah. I still love the snow here, though. It's beautiful. It's um, it's very different to what Sydney ever looked like. So for me, it's a novelty still. People are always like, you're tired of the snow yet? I'm like, it still looks so pretty. <laughs> oh, I imagine that it is. I mean, I remember the first time I saw, like... Okay, so we've had... I say real snow. We've had real snow here a couple of times since I've been alive. Like in my 42 years, we've had real snow several times, like real powder. You can make a nice, you know, a couple of times, but not really all that deep, not really all that often. 
normally when we get real snow when we get snow it just turns into ice like there's that thin layer of ice on the top so you're crunching through it's not that, that soft sort of powder where it's all night it's like you're breaking through glass as you walk so it's, it's all this hard crunching but i remember the first time i saw real like snow it was in virginia I went skiing uh and it was some family friends it was just absolutely breathtaking like i said we've had it we've had it here a couple times where it was like that but it's not very often like the the first time i remember really seeing it was very it was in virginia and it's just an amazing thing to see probably when you know but that real beautiful powder snow like you see on the ives and courier stuff yeah. yeah, we get pretty snow here, and and the trees are you know get all covered with it, and it looks like for at least for somebody who's wasn't raised with it, it always looks like a Christmas postcard wherever I yeah. go here. So, which is I'll nice. So, what did you think of? We don't normally I don't normally ask you this question, but I don't know if you I don't know if you'd read Morning of Magicians before tonight or not. What did you think of the book? Okay, so I, again, way. yeah, like you, I think I, last time I read it was over twenty years ago. Um. So we're going to jump right into it. We're not, or are, are we skipping? I guess we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll give it this way because well, you should great... tell me a little bit about your yeah. dealing with the, the light with the other entities in the library. Cause well, I'm that's sure what I was about to, like, I didn't hear we'll it. it. I'll, I'll give you a little taste of, of my report on this and then we'll get into the, you know, what actually happened. Um, here's the thing because it's a translated work. I keep that in the back of my head. No, because there's no such thing as translation. There's only ever interpretation. Um, and so I sort of, it's like, this, I'm not reading the prose that the author themselves, the authors put into it. So I always try and keep that in my mind. Um, that being said, I think that, I think the 2019, 20 year old me versus the 42 year old me, I think we had very different, different perspectives on the text i'll say it that way i think the thing that stood out is it's less the text and more how i'm now reading the text right um so i think that's that's really going to be a big crux of of my review is just i think there's i think the the younger me versus the older me has again it's not the text that's changed it's i that have changed and where once i you know yeah i'll be honest i never really saw it as being Again, trying to be polite here. I think it was well written for what they were trying to do. But again, now I'm looking back on it and I'm like, oh, oh, hold on. I get it. And I and, and the rest of that sentence is not going to be very pleasant, but I'll save that for the rest of it. Um, speaking of unpleasant, I will say this. The uh the elves. Were un were they were not in the best of mood today. The uh, the torture dungeon had not. It's like they it's like they they hadn't cleaned for two weeks. And I'm like, what's going on, guys? Like, I know it's a torture dungeon and all, but what's going on here? What what's with the dishevelment? I see. I didn't realize that elves have like an earlier Thanksgiving, so they were all on vacation. And I'm like, oh, okay, so y'all take an early Thanksgiving. Okay, I guess that makes sense. Elves, different timelines, things like that. I get it. Time works different in the in the library. What bothered me wasn't even the dishevelment per se. It was the giant freaking spiders. Why do we have giant freaking spiders in the, in the torture dungeon, Dean? Well, it's not really, you know, it's a, either above or below my pay grade. I'm just... I'm just hired to pull the books and read them. So I don't know why. That's the, probably a question for the elves, really. They they said to talk to you about it. They said that, oh, you, did they? They, they said they, you ordered them. They're, they're shirking their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. You know who probably does know about that, though, to be honest? Mm -hmm. And we didn't talk about them last week, which was funny considering our topic is the actual the Darrows mm -hmm. down Oh, there. yeah. The Darrows do all the torturing. So I bet you they're the real culprits when it comes to yeah comes to I, giant spiders in the dungeons i don't like talking to the darrows no dude. i noticed not that with, last week not you were like that, i'm not gonna mention the darrows not with that nose dude 
the nose thing it's prehensile and i'm just it's so weird it's so weird talking to them well they're scary that's for sure they're crazy but and I, I try to offer i always try to offer them peanuts and like we're not elephants and i'm like but you got the trunk and they take it personally and yeah the next thing the... you know you're running from set in this <laughs> yeah that whole area the whole shaver area of the library man they've got Weird. great material in there but the the, the staff in that part are, are best to be avoided back to your point though about morning of the magicians and before we go or before you go to unkind i'm which is kind of ironic because i'm so harsh on so many books yeah there's all kinds of problems let me just begin by saying there's all kinds of problems with this book yeah but i know what you mean when you said today when you read it it's probably different to the 20 year old you reading it i know when i first read the book i would have been in my 20s i actually bought it for the first time i had a czech friend in australia who'd already mm -hmm. read it he was a european this book was far bigger in europe than i think oh absolutely. In, in the yeah, absolutely and he knew it he saw i bought i, I hadn't even read it. i bought oh you got mm -hmm. morning of the magicians you got to lend it to me so mm -hmm. i lent it to him the guy literally kept it for about a year and then i finally got it he'd already he was already such a fan of it he yeah. wanted to read it again mm -hmm. but when you, i know when you read it particularly before you've maybe read an awful lot of similar material it does feel, and particularly probably at that age, it does feel like you you might be reading something that has some great secret in there. You might be reading something mm -hmm. which has come close to, I guess, cracking the cosmic egg. And there aren't many books that I've read either when I was younger and was much more of a believer or today when I'm obviously far more jaded. There aren't many books that still have that tone. Yeah. Now, that said, yeah. there's all, there's all kinds of historical problems and things have been you know oh, yeah. reassessed since. And but just reading the book, if you right. take it outside mm -hmm. of any context, which we can never do. I mean, that's what we do at, at Mysterious right. Libraries. We put it into context. It seems to just be loaded with so much esoteric information, and it's woven together in such a way that you really think Berger and Powell. Have cracked something, and incidentally, they've. I know we're only reading the French translation, oh, yeah. but if you compare the writing, even in the translation, to say mm -hmm. Eric von Daniken, who they clearly influenced. This book came out about ten oh, years yeah. before and was a major book in Europe. There's no doubt von Daniken would have read. Oh, he this. had to have. Yeah, and well, it's loaded with everything von Daniken talks about. Everything from yeah. you know who built the pyramids to Easter Island to the Piri Reis maps to the Aztec, not the yeah, well, to the Aztecs and the yeah. Mayans to um to the Nazca Plain, like er, al almost all of Von Danik, not I'm exaggerating, but an awful lot of Von Daniken's main evidence had been talked mm -hmm. about by Berger and Powell 10 years before, suggesting that all of these things pointed mm -hmm. to an ancient civilization that might be extraterrestrial. They dropped that a number of times. They might be yeah. people from elsewhere. So, but when you read it, it's not like just reading Chariots of the Gods, where there's one point, and the one point right. in that book is extraterrestrials visited the world in the past they were what we considered gods there's that in this book but there's also woven in amongst so there the everything. idea of all of these the idea of this ongoing yeah. secret tradition which is you know been kind of guiding us and has we've always had secret rulers might be the wrong term but there's this big idea that there's there's people on this earth who know things and keep it to themselves and there's yeah. ideas of how the species is transforming and as i said to you when we were joking about both of us having to read it pretty quickly this week is that you can speed read a lot of books you can speed read chariots yeah. of the gods in an hour and you'll understand the entire book yeah you could do the same with morning of the magicians in fact in fairness to berger and pals god bless them they're like it's the modern world we don't expect anybody to spend more than two or three hours reading this book you know just yeah. go for it wherever you want to open the chapters that interest you but at the same time if you do if you do that you you could miss you could miss a whole section. You could miss a whole section on Charles Fort. You could miss a whole section right. on, on Arthur Mackin. You could miss a whole section on Nazi occultism. You could miss a whole section on ancient civilizations. You could miss a whole section on this mutants living amongst us who will be the rulers of the future. Like there's so many ideas in there. Right. If you do a real skip, you're going to miss things. There's a lot of data in this book. Yeah. Oh no, there absolutely is. And let me go ahead. There's because, like, like I said, I was going. I'm going to. I smack my microphone around like I'm surprised it's there. Um, 
like I'm going to be a little harsh on this one. And I know this is sort of a reverse for, for us. Cause normally I'm, I'm the one being like, put it in context. Let's look at it. And you're the one who's always like, it's horrible. It's, you have the they're mad, they're crazy like, people writing this book, but no, and you're like, you're like, you're and hack this thing apart. And I'm like, dude, it's just a paperback. You know, we got to return it. But there, there's one quote I want to be up front because there is one quote in the book that for me is something of a saving grace because I've got a huge problem with the book. There's one massive problem I have with the book, but this tempers that problem. And it's this quote. Let us repeat that there will be a lot of silliness in our book, but this matters little if the book stirs up a few vocations and to a certain degree prepares broader tracks for research. They even stipulate, you know, one of the big things about this is that they're not saying that any of this is necessarily real. It is a novel. It's sort of that it's in this weird gray area, like where amazing stories is like, this is real, but you look at it, you're like, okay, this is, mm, there's a lot more story going on here than, than reality. This one's sort of like, yeah, they're like, we're not really trying to tell you something real per se. There's realities here. We want you to break outside of the mold that you are currently in, rethink these things, and then and allow for there to be a broader conversation. And in that, I think it tempers a lot of my critique of the book. Because I do have one ma massive problem with it. But at the same time, I kind of have to look at my problem and say, but they're kind of saying that's not what this book is about. Right? Uh, as an academic, you understand. Bibliography, citing your sources... I'm one, I love data. Like you said, I love data. I like being able to say, okay, what are we looking at here? Right. Cause people say things like, well, numbers don't lie. Yeah, they do. Numbers lie all the time. That's why you got to look at where are these numbers coming from? How are they collate? How are they, you know, how are they correlated? How are they, how are they gathered so that you can know what you're really dealing with? Cause I can take any event in history. I can take any event or, or a scientific or anything and make it say whatever I want. If I if I don't have to present you with my findings or my numbers, I can make it. And, and it's not like and again, horse, love you, but but we've talked about this in the past last couple of months. We've seen that that's exactly what a lot of the scientific community has done. It's my number one complaint with with a lot of archaeologists is that a lot of this data is heavily manipulated. That's why I want to see where you're getting all this from. They have no bibliography in this. There is no source. There are materials cited in the work itself, mm -hmm. right? There's some footnotes, and sometimes yeah. they reference it in there. But you're right there, and there's lots of stuff yeah. which isn't referenced at all as well. The yeah. vast majority, they even say we're not going to do a lot of footnotes. We're not going to do a lot of big bibliographies because they don't want to weigh you down. And so, in that, for me, the problem becomes okay. Again. It is tempered with the fact that they're trying, they're not saying it's real per se. They're, they're saying we want to open up a conversation, but I'm like, well, how can I have a conversation about something if I don't know where you're getting this from? Right. Well, they have, if, a, they, they call this genre. They've invented fantastic realism, right? Is yeah. what they actually, the term they use. I don't, I don't know if anybody else has ever used that. Term. I have the, I, I actually had the French term pulled up. Let me see if I can find it. Cause not that I'll pronounce it correctly anyway. Fantastic realism. Yeah. yeah it's. <laughs> That is exactly how I would sound. Like it's not even where I just had it too. I'll find it. But yeah, I mean, like you said, it, it they consider it fantastic realism. So it's not necessary. Again, the fact that they flat out tell you they're not necessarily giving you something that they think is true. They're trying to create a conversation that's outside of the what we would say the paradigm, say tempers my complaint. But yeah, it's like if we want to have the conversation, we need to have a conversation with what you're actually talking about. Like, where is the line between where you're just making crap up and when you actually have something, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's my that's my number one complaint for the entire book yeah. is I want to know where when are you just making stuff up so I can be like, okay, you're just this is fake, but here's the or here's the reality that I can work with. And then I can go on my own journey. Like that's not, that's not re I mean, I'm not saying again, it's not zero, but by and large, that's not a journey that they, they don't give you the information that allows you to make the journey yourself uh, as yeah. often as I would like. Yeah. I, I'm, I like this book. 
No. I think almost nothing in it is true, <laughs> but it's, it's, I think it's very well written for a book in this space. Yep. It's a book, which even reading it now, probably over 20 years, maybe 30 years after I'd first read the thing, I read it a long time ago, originally probably 20 something years. I still found it's, even though I know so much of it is nonsense, relatively convincing. Yeah. Now I don't believe it, but it's not like if I pick up Chariots of the Gods now, which we did recently, and read it, I'm yeah. like, this is just so. Uh, no offense, Eric von Daniken, if you're watching, I'm just yeah. not impressed, right? But there's something about this book, and you know what I think it is. I think it's true at a very strange archetypal level. I don't think it's true at all yeah. in reality. And there's, and you know why? And this is this mm -hmm. is maybe what I find the most telling passage in the entire book. Okay. It's only short and I'll read it. And I think this says an awful lot about why this book was successful, but more to the point, it says an awful lot about Powell and Bergier and their thinking, mm -hmm. which I'll kind of dissect a little bit after I've read the passage or at least interpret why I think it's so significant. And the problem not the problem, rather the passage is the probable explanation for all of this in our opinion, and this is about the whole kind of conspiratorial version of history that they have, Yeah, is the existence of a magic puzzle, a powerful and satanic mystical current such as we have tried to describe in the course of the preceding chapters. This could explain a great many terrible facts in a more realistic way than that of the conventional historians who are ready to attribute so many cruel and irrational acts to the megalomania of a syphilitic the sadism of a handful of never mm -hmm. nevropaths and the servile obedience of a pack of cowards. Now that's in the section where they're talking about the occult roots of Nazism right. and the idea yeah. that the Nazi party is founded by occultists and they believe a wide range of things, including mm -hmm. popular science under Nazism, which was the idea of the eternal ice and the idea of the drill society, which was based on right. a book. For the, which also, everybody should read. We should do it sometime. The Coming Race by um, by Bulwer Lytton, and also on mm -hmm. and the Coming Race is almost like what we were talking about last week in a way. Although they're not all evil like the Deros in the Shaver mystery, but this idea that beneath the earth, there's yeah. this. And this was fiction, by the way. Bill Willitton was a significant writer in the 19th century in England, maybe one of the most significant. And that there was this race beneath the earth that um, had all these powers and they were going to one day come to the surface maybe and you know, take things mm -hmm. over. And that is very much in some ways like the Deros idea in Shaver. The idea of these subterranean yeah. worlds mm -hmm. are quite potent. So there was the real society in in pre-World War II Germany, which was supposedly significant on Hitlerian or, or Nazi thinking. There was also right. the Thule Society, which mm -hmm. was kind of like a Nordic or German version yeah. of the Atlantis myth, the idea that there'd yeah, been an, an island to the north with this great civilization. So maybe, I don't know, up Norway, Greenland somewhere, and mm -hmm. it had sunk. And that it was kind of like Atlantis, but yeah. if Atlantis had been in the north. And their point is that all these Nazi ideas are predicated on these weird occult ideas and their sense of the the Uber the um the Ubushman, right, or the Superman is based yeah. on an actual genuine esoteric secret kind of race or advanced people, just like the theosophists under Madame Blavatsky believed in that there were these adepts uh, yeah. on the planet who kind of mm -hmm. guided guided our reality but why i think this was so significant for berger and pals not not to mention that pals had come mm -hmm. from this kind of background anyway he'd been a, a student of the kind of gurdjieff system of you know trying to reach enlightenment which is related to theosophy so he'd already been stepped in some yeah. of this kind of occultism but the fact that these two men they met, I think, about six years before they wrote the book. They wrote the book for five years. In other words, right. the book comes out in 1960. They meet in about 1954 and start working on it afterwards. In Europe, Europe's not like America. In 1954, the trauma of World War II is still, still so... There. 
so yeah. real. You've got a Cold War, which you're kind of in the middle of between the Soviets mm -hmm. and between the United States of America. And yet Europe's stuck in this. It, ha it hasn't been able to come to grips with what just happened to us still. A lot of people really couldn't. I mean, this was a... In this was a, such a staggering apocalyptic present. And yeah. Berger and Powell's often talk about the problem of the present, that the answer is in the future and in the past. And I think both of them, and this is a, I don't like to psychologize when I really analyze too much, but I'm going to, Fair. I think their opinions are so mm -hmm. formed by living through World War II. Don't forget Berger was in a concentration camp for the last year of World War II. Right, and he he was in the French Resistance for a big part of World War Two. Like the war was really significant to both of these men. Anybody who lived in yeah. France, believe me, World War Two, it wasn't like you lived on the other side of the world. Maybe you lost a son or you went to fight or something. Your whole reality was just was what reshaped. happened. How did this happen for five years to the you know, or for ten yep. years, or how did how did Europe go crazy? And so I think, like that passage says. Or historians just explain this like a madman, i.e. Hitler, all of yeah. these crazy followers and you know servile mm -hmm. people who don't rise up to them in a way, it makes more archetypal sense if there is some weird satanic occultic undercurrent guiding history because who who the devil wants to look at it and think it's as simple that a crazy person got control of the reins of power and this destroyed mm -hmm. an entire continent and drove an entire planet into a war which killed tens of 20s of 30s 40s 50s and millions of people not to mention just tens of millions of civilians i yeah. mean this was so devastating to the psyche particularly of europeans i think it goes a long way to explaining why these other way of interpreting history what is mm -hmm. so attractive to berger and pals in the 1950s no i think so there's a point i want to come back to but i want to talk about what you're about this the world war ii aspect because you're right this is, I mean, they're in, they're writing in France, like you said, in the fifties, there were still parts of France. There are still parts of, of Paris that were just rubble from the war. Like it wasn't just, you're right. I, I had forgot, I had completely forgotten about the whole concentration camp aspect and that they had, again, their engagement in the, but it's like, you knew, well, hold on, this is being written in the fifties, published in the sixties or 1960. They were engaged in World War II. They participated. They were in France. They were in occupied France. So that's there. I forgot about the about the concentration camp part. But even just again, the context of they are looking around. Even if they've been 10 years removed from the event, you know, from the end of World War II. It it's just stopped to think about what that means. 10 years removed. 10 years ago was 2012. You know? That's not a long time in, in, I mean, 10 years is not a long time at all. It's both, it's forever, but it's also that uh, yeah. fast. It seems like yet yeah, 10 years ago to me, seems like yesterday. Oh, exactly. Yeah, the, and, but the, imagine if I've been in a concentration camp exactly. less than 10 years, bef less than 10 years ago, how would that yeah. have shaped and fought in the French resistance? Yeah. You are literally, you're literally killing people. You're you're out there. You're killing. It, this is one of those things. And just from a, a slight deviation from this particular text, for the moment, this is something a lot of people don't get about the culture that emerges post World War II, right? The that the men who fought in that war came home. They. This is why you didn't see a lot of ultra violence and stuff for decades because they saw it. They knew what that was. Uh, there was a story uh, of a, a guy who came home and he was uh, with his father. Um, and Or he was telling the story to his son about why he didn't hunt. Because he grew up hunting, right? He was, you know, farm boy, you hunt all the time. It was a big thing for them. And um, it was after the war. He'd finally come home. They finally you know, decided to go hunting. And he goes out and he shoots a deer. Uh, no, it was a rabbit. That's what it was. It was just a simple rabbit, right? It was, they're just varmint hunting. And he said that he looked at it and he never shot again. He never shot another animal because he couldn't take it. It was just for him. That was one more life. But even though he's like, I know he's like, he didn't become a vegan or anything like that. It just, he's like, just the thought of blood on his hands one more time was just too much. 
there is a reason why the culture post World War II, you see things like musicals. You see a lot of these things because these were people who saw real, I mean, some of the worst things humanity's ever done. So in Berger, and then again, going back to the text, when they're writing this book, it's not just that, that you know, they're only 10 years removed from that. They literally cannot look around where they live and not see evidence in the scars that were because it they were still fixing things in France, particularly in into the 80s and 90s. There were still buildings in the 80s and 90s that had been bombed out from World War II that had not been repaired. So they hadn't been torn down and rebuilt. That's how like we as Americans do not understand that context. So to your point, I think this is the broader point. Why is the why does the book seem so true on an archetypal level? And it's Spence, really don't forget, go. the whole middle of the book's essentially about yeah. Nazism and about the occult oh, exactly. roots of Nazism and trying to explain. It's almost mm -hmm. like it's this has to be more than just a nut job got control of the reins of power and had some sycophants mm -hmm. who followed him in. There has to be a bigger meaning to this. Yeah. You can see them working through it, you know. Right. And it's and that's completely again, this is one of those points where I temper my complaint because to your point, I would understand that. And here's the thing. I agree with that. Going back to this, because I think the rest of my commentary is really going to be in the archetypal nature of it, of the book itself. If you know, there's a higher truth to it, even if it's not necessarily the truth that's presented there. And I think this is what the, the core of the archetypal truth that we're going to talk about is that I do agree with this. I don't agree with their conclusions per se, I think there's some bad, there's some faulty logic, there's some faulty evidence, but at the core saying, look, this isn't just some random nut job. There is something more here. There's something deeper, darker, more powerful behind him. I, I completely agree with him in that because he's right. There was more going on during World War II. I would argue there's more going on all throughout human history. I would disagree with the conclusion, but not the thesis. Yeah, to the point of more going on throughout history, that's probably the number one. It's probably the number one theme of the book. The number one yeah. through or through line of the book mm -hmm. is that, and they pull up lots of examples. They pull up things like the Rosicrucian poster flap yeah. in in 1600s in France, where the, supposedly mm -hmm. the secret society of the Rosicrucians posted posters mm -hmm. everywhere saying you know where this secret group living among you they go through popular alchemical books of the day like um fulcanelli's yeah. what's it called the the mystery of the cathedrals and supposedly bergier met fulcanelli who was it was kind of his alias this very famous occult alchemical writer the idea that hidden in the actual architecture of cathedrals here is the messages of yeah. alchemy and the idea that in the all throughout history so they talk about the gupta empire of ancient india it's funny because we we study that in my daughter's homeschooling only recently that oh, cool. the emperor i think his name was akosha who was the really peaceful emperor yeah. kind yeah. of had this group of the secret nine men who had all, who were the ones left with the knowledge and the control of warlike technology and all of these things so it couldn't infect indian culture and then so we've got the the alchemists hidden we've mm -hmm. got the gupta dynasty people hidden we've got the rosicrucians hidden and then they just go through thing after thing after yeah. thing including the nazis secret masters including the theosophical ideas including the stuff arthur macken wrote about including the ideas of hp lovecraft so they list and it goes on and on and on but throughout the book there's this idea that there are people who are essentially a, ongoing secret societies that have informed culture yeah. and they're clever in the way that they discuss it because they're like, well, in the olden days there were guilds and you could only understand the language of that trade. If you're a member of that trade, so the guild could have its own secret kind of language mm -hmm. and they kind of come forward to the science or they go through alchemy as well, which has its own kind yeah. of language. And then they come up to scientists today and they go like, if there are two nuclear physicists or high-end mathemat mathematicians talking, 
you can't understand what they're talking about if you're not part of the club. And more to the point, people at that level of intelligence want to seek out other people who are of that same level of intelligence yeah. to converse with. So you're going to get these secret conspiracies by default, which to me is, that's probably the most fascinating idea in the book that yes. people are drawn mm -hmm. to each other who are of this kind of level. And then it goes all the way through, of course, by the end where he's talking about, there might already be mutants living amongst us who have their own, you know, secrets, which by the way, probably mm -hmm. led to Marvel's X-Men. So we were talking yeah. about Kirby's influence on the MCU last week. It's quite possible Berger and Powell's yeah. influence had a big influence on the foundation of the X-Men. But the point is anyway that this, uh, this kind of through line that there's these people who are somehow more intellectually gifted or they're more in touch with the truth. And as a result, they mm -hmm. almost have to come together to have their right. own thing going on. And plus, they all, they as good as say, you don't want nuclear secrets being left necessarily with everybody it might be good yeah. if there are only a certain elite who have access to this kind of data and this kind of information so at one moment they're critical of some elements of these secret elites i think they're critical of the uh, certainly of the, the the theosophical and nazi types you know secret adepts and secret masters pulling the strings or so that's what they say what they believe goes on. But at the same time, they're like, well, it makes sense that gifted scientists are going to talk to each other in their own language and not want to share their ideas of how to destroy the world. So, but it's an ongoing yeah. from the very beginning until the end of the book. That's almost the through line. Right. No. And, and back to your sort of going back to the idea of the archetypal nature. I think the reason this, because you're right. And I think he actually has a, I think that he, they have a really great point on that. And, for me, I think one of the reasons, again, going back to this ar archetypal truth within the book as a through line as well, is, and I th again, why the 20-year-old me looked at it one way, whereas the 42-year-old me is looking at it differently. That is, this book in a lot of ways reads like you're in college, your friends are high. I just didn't partake of that kind of thing. I'm allergic to weed. But, you know, you have, you're at the bar. They've you know they've you know they they've uh, been smoking the devil's lettuce and you know you're a few you're a few beers in and all of a sudden time's not real <laughs> you know you're going to have that conversation <laughs> right it's like time's not real and i think maybe chipmunks know more than they're letting on it that's how this book reads so again my my number one complaint is the lack of footnoting da da da, da. fine i've already talked about that this is both the, this is my number one, this is where, where the 42-year-old me is looking at this like, oh, for the love of Pete. It just, it feels like it's that you're in college, it's 2 a.m., your friend had the munchies, and that's why you're, you're at the, you're at the bar, you're, you know, it, or you've, you're at Papa John's, I swear, I, I, my roommate would come and he'd, he'd be like, J-Mac, then he'd kick the bed. Oh, good. You're awake. You want to grab a pizza? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, sure. Why not? And, oh, and, and you're days. talking and you're, again, it's like time's not real. The, and the chipmunks know more than they're letting on. It, that's how this book reads. It is to your point. They take a lot of like some stuff that is real. We know it's real. We know some of these aspects were things that did happen. And then they they start do, again. You could argue this is sort of the origin of conspiracy of the modern conspiracy theorist, where they start sewing and tying it all up together, asking what if, right? The ultimate question, well, what if? And build because you said because I like that point. It's like, well, hey, wouldn't these secret societies sort of make sense? Because I'm entitled, I'm an escrow officer. We have our own language. Loan officers don't even understand what we're talking about half the time. Because, you know. That's how it goes. Like you said, physicists, mathematicians, they're, I'm, I will sit there and I, I'll listen to my wife, you know, talk to somebody because she, she tutors a lot of things. And I'm like, I have no idea what they're talking about. I can usually hang, but every once in a while, they're like, they take that one step over and I'm like, I'm out. I'm going to go. Mm -hmm make queso or something because i'm i'm out of the conversation and it's quite prescient so, in that it's quite prescient in that way as well because they talk about i don't use the term 
a technocracy. I think they talk about a cryptocracy right. or something yeah. like a secret mm -hmm. thing, but they do, they, well, they don't use the term technocracy. They certainly talk about the idea that the concept of it, it yeah. isn't so much necessarily. Yeah. The, the traditional holders of power that you think might hold the power going forward or anymore. It might be essentially scientists and technocrats and people yeah. who have hold of the secrets. And, we see how true in many ways that's become. If you even look at, we won't go political because we don't go political on this network, but if you look at even the last couple of years, mm -hmm. the overwhelming, we saw the overwhelming power of a medical and scientific technocracy in dictating public policy that had to be followed because science. Yeah. Right. And that's something that they're talking about back yeah. in the 1950s. And which again makes sense considering where they just came out of, right? It's that it's that broader context of the story or of this novel, which is they just got out of World War II. They can see how this stuff goes. They lived through it. We're 70 years removed from it at this point. So for us, and again, that's why a lot of people, you know, again, not to go too far off, but it's I can understand why they would be talking about themes in a lot of ways that was that do sound very similar to today. History repeats. It may not repeat, but it definitely rhymes. So these thoughts are going to be in their head. Mm -hmm. And I like that point that you're, you're bringing up. It's like, Hey, you know, this is, you know, it's like, there's a reason you know, they don't use some of the same terms that we would today, but that's because they're talking 60, literally 60 years ago. So for them, it's going to be a different phrase, but it's the same animal. And that's why it looks the same. It's why it sounds the same. That's why it's very, the things they're talking about are very, very familiar. But again, I, like you said, I think in many ways, this, the book is more true in archetypal level than it is in any one theory or any one idea. Again, there are threads. There are things that they, that are absolutely true and real and observed and all these things. And then there's the rest of it. But it's it's the act of weaving these things together that I think we as um, that's very familiar to us in many ways looks very much like something that we see happening today, right? The you know in many ways they are the Alex Jones of sixty years ago. Mm -hmm. They just weren't selling vitamins at the time. <laughs> They're also kind of the Charles Fort of France of the 1960s. I right. mean, I believe, I think it was Pal was actually the editor and the person who was very forceful mm -hmm. in getting the complete works, or at least Book of the Damned or some of Charles yeah. Fort's work published in France. And yeah. in so, not only is there a big chunk in that which is takes big passages from Fort and talks about mm -hmm. Fort's ideas. And so clearly Charles Fort's a major influence yeah. on this book, but in a way, in some ways, stylistically, it's a little bit like Fort as well. In other words, there's mm -hmm. all of this kind of data thrown at you. There's all these kind of ideas. Now Fort kind of just throws out a lot of different theories and he has his, you know, yeah. his tongue in his cheek half of the time, but there doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be as much tongue in cheek in Berger and Powell's, but at the same time, as you said before, they do say, listen, that people are going to laugh at us, I'm sure, in the future and say they got this wrong, they got that wrong, kind of like we are now. Right. To me, in many ways, the value of it almost is, and this is being very sympathetic, Yes, is it's almost like a thought experiment. It's almost like saying, let's look at the history of the world as if something very different was going on to what we thought was going on. Yeah. And, and I think another value, so that's one of the values. It's just an, it's a, it's a fun, you know, intellectual read. The more you know about this stuff, the more you'll see right. the problems yeah. in it. Right. But also an, another interesting thing, of course, is they're writing at a time where the future seems here, you know, in the nine, by the, certainly by the time it's released in the 1960s, this is very much, um, this is very much an era where people are very conscious. America is a great example of it. It was the, mm -hmm. probably the highest, you know, quality of living ever yeah. in the history of the world in America in the 1950s. But there was this idea of, you know, oh, we're kind of already living in the future. There's the Jetsons and there's this and that and the other. But they kind of turn their back on the present, which I think is yeah. kind of super cool and interesting as well. Like they're like, 
something about the past, maybe the ancients already understood the advanced physics, right. which we're only going to get to in the future. So they, they often have terms like we have one eye on the past and one eye on the future or something. They tend to, in a period where people are quite conscious of the advances and how wonderful everything is, they tend to be saying, you know, things were be we knew more once upon a time and we're going to know more in the future. Again. Yeah. Well, so I was one of the things I was looking up, I because you're right about the Charles Ford that like they are sort of that Charles that Charles Ford of that era. Even though they're they're looking at Charles Ford, and again, we tend to forget Bernard uh Hilfman's was um uh oh he wasn't French. Belgian, uh, I think. Belgian, right? thank you. Yeah. yeah, he was Belgian. Um, so again, they were very familiar with their work. And I was, I was, there was a magazine that uh, they went to work for after they wrote the book that I was going to point out. It's like, this is exactly because they're on that sort of. I think they line. ran that magazine, that occulty kind yeah. of power. Yeah, they did. Magazine. That's what I'm saying. Like, after they were done with this book, they went on to create it. And essentially, it was like the French version of Fate magazine, is what we would think of. Um, but something you were just talking about, and I, that's why I was double checking something, was this, we, we tend to forget this island Earth was pub was uh debuted in 1955 so by the same time they're they're meeting and they're starting to talk about and work on this book you know this island earth is coming out and it, it's one of those things where it, i know it sounds like you know that doesn't sound all that connected but it's the it goes back to the idea that what you were talking about of the uh, again that broader context of their of the what are they think? What are the what is the culture thinking about? Or like you said, the ignoring of the present. They're like we feel they feel like they're in the future. It's the they literally called it the push button era, right? Like you could push a button, something would happen. And again, it's easy. We should talk about with the World War II aspect, but that also means for most of them growing up, a lot they probably didn't have a lot of access to electric lights yet. An automobile was not something that everyone had telephones radios like these were still really new inventions depending on where you were i mean i i i know people yeah okay 20 years ago they were in their 40s or 50s right maybe even 60s who grew up without electric lights who grew up go using an actual outhouse. Oh, yeah. My mother grew up with an outhouse. Mm -hmm. She still tells the story about her and her sister would go together because they'd be scared at night and they'd have a light there and, you know, they'd yep. want to stay in the light because it was so dark. So to think, yeah, my parents' generation, they still didn't have internal yeah. sewerage plumbing, you know. Yeah, or, or they didn't have, again, electric lights. Like they used actual kerosene lamps. Like Yeah. for the, I mean, you just have to realize, for a lot of people growing up, they weren't... The, like they knew things like radios and movies and things existed, but they didn't have the kind of contact with it that they would have a few decades later, post-World War II, everyone's got a car or knows somebody who has a car. Everyone's got a radio. Some people are starting to, you know, it, it, it was very common to go watch a movie. It was very common to see airplanes and use a phone. So they, to your point, there was such a radical shift in technology in the purveyance of technology that they would have felt like they were living in the Jetsons. Nowadays, this is all very commonplace. The idea that I can, I can find anything in the world, basically, uh, let's not go too far into it. But essentially every, anything in the world I want to know, I can know on this phone at any time, anywhere I want. I can talk to any human on the planet on this thing, anywhere they are. I've got friends. I've got friends I keep in contact with all the time in Africa. You know, and not even like the major, like they're removed from the, you know, I, people in Papua New Guinea, Japan, Ireland, it doesn't matter. Boom, I can talk to him. You know, I mean, that's, this is something we forget that like that shift happens so quickly. Of course, they'd be like, well, what is it? it again, it's that, it's that extra push to break the, the paradigm. Because like, if we can go from, for their perspective, horse and buggy to, blowing up the world with atomic bombs if i swear it's like i don't even know this this thing's here half the time um <laughs> they smack it around like it's a red-headed stepchild you know it's like these are you know the germans were their neighbors now all of a sudden they're trying to wipe them out it's like that kind of shift can happen so fast 
it would be almost natural to say, well, then what happened in the deep past? Particularly if you do see these weird hinky things happening, right? There are these weird sort of hinky events. It's like, you know, maybe, maybe this is something that's happened before. And Germany too, don't forget, was the country really of mm -hmm. the enlightenment almost. I mean, Germany yeah. was considered this sophisticated, progressive, you know, kind of yeah. European country. And they make the very interesting point too. And I can see how this would be quite formative on some of your mm -hmm. actual ideas, how when Germany became a civilization unto itself for like mm -hmm. over a decade, how their science Yes. And their belief systems traveled in their own direction. Like Nazi mm -hmm. science was not American science. No. And incidentally, similar things happened with the Soviets later as well. Like Soviet no. science had its own whacked out ideas as well. But we're talking about the Nazis for now. Nazi science started to have all of these whacked out ideas. But at the same time, within that concept, they made all these incredible advancements. So yeah. it's almost, it's like looking at a different civilization mm -hmm. in the same time period as the rest of the West. Right. Yeah. And the, the Nazis were doing both incredible things technologically, as well as just ridiculous things like yeah. their belief that one of the Nazi occult beliefs that we lived inside a hollow earth, like we were inside, the earth was hollow and we were inside, yeah. meant that they thought they could point radar, like, okay, well, the British fleet must be here somewhere, so we'll point our radar that way, you know, or their equivalent of radar, and they had something else as well, some other kind of technology. Right. And so it, it, in some ways it was just absolutely ludicrous, but at the same time, they mm -hmm. made such phenomenal advances in rocket technology because – Von Braun, for example, all he wanted to oh, do, yeah. and this is what they talk about, was go to the moon. Yeah. Like Von Braun was just like, I don't care about the war. I just want to make rockets to go to the moon, <laughs> you know? Yep. So at the same time, there's these amazing advances. And there's also this terrible philosophy, which manifests not only scientific madness, like things which are crazy, but as well, of course, incredible destruction and, and incredible cruelty. So how do you, in a, it's, it's hard to think now, even though there are plenty of horrible regimes on the planet, but it's hard to think of a regime coexisting with us that has an entirely different scientific outlook on the world. Right. Well, in, in like, so like many... China might be China might be evil or whatever, but it doesn't have a different science to what we do. It doesn't understand right. where we are in the cosmos or how the world's built or you know what. It doesn't have those kind of sciences. The Nazis had different sciences, and I think that's something that's something else yeah. which actually is pretty interesting in the Bergian right. Power. Right? The no, they it, point it, that out so much. That's a great point. Like it, like you said, it's it's they're essentially a completely different society. But that weird 10 years where they're locked up with themselves, essentially, running through everything, it really is weird. And and I can see them saying there need there must be something more going on here because look at what they did so quickly. And look at what they said that they did, how they said they did. They did say that they talked to things, that they were communicating with things. Uh, I was looking up something else entirely. And you know sort of referencing and they, they it was it was the spy museum that's what it was the spy museum here in the u.s they talked about hey this sounds crazy but they had people who were essentially i mean they they claimed it was it was something more to it than just psychic ability but essentially they had psychics looking for submarines and planning raids and it worked didn't work all the time but it worked well enough for them to be used militarily this you know these people advanced like, again germany was always sort of on the forefront of technology but what they did between world war one and world war two is shocking anyone who's looked at what they did and though like you said in this it is nuts what they did in this short a time uh we still we see this all the time with like it's like it's we were sort of because we know it happened we aren't as shocked by it. But think about every science fiction novel that has some human meeting an alien. There's always this theme of the alien saying, wait, they went from here, from caveman, or they went from the Iron Age to having spaceflight how fast? Right? It's like what y'all did in a century, which took us a thousand years. 
there is this constant theme of how did they advance so quickly? And this is where it came from. What Germany was able to pull off in that short amount of time. Guys, if there's anything you can take away from this is just understand there for, for these people to, again, being, you know, just a few, you know, 10 years removed from world war II, seeing that rapid development of technology for them to say the Nazis did this that fast. That's insane. Cause it wasn't just, they did it. They did it. They militarized it and they mechanized it. That those are three very different steps. Each one taking time. That means their science was advancing way faster than it should have. So for them to look at the, at the Nazi cultists and say, there has to be something going on here because it's something that's real, not a theory, not just some sort of, Again, not the 2 a.m., you know, munchies kind of conver college conversation, but they're like, there is something here. And the and the people who did it said it's because of the occult. You know, they, they're like, it's these weird theories, this weird view of reality that allowed them to do it. If I was in their position, I think I'd take that really seriously. And again, this is why I think my sympathy for the book is. I do kind of agree with them on a lot of stuff, not necessarily the specifics of their conclusion, but this idea that there's more going on to these events. There's more behind this. This isn't just what you're seeing. I agree with that. Again, I disagree with the conclusion, but I agree with that concept. And I think if we're all being honest with ourselves, yeah, we have to agree with, with a lot of what's working on here, which is why it seems, why the book seems so archetypically true, if not true in 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 the granular you know actual facts of the book yeah they uh, that's that, it rings true even though it's nonsense you know what i mean yeah. and one of the problems is and why neither of us can you know go oh we think the book's right is because as you said before not even so much a lack of sources but even sources that are just like flat out wrong you know what i mean just like we right. know now okay that's definitely even then we knew that wasn't true like the piri reese maps which von daniken talks about as well which supposedly show the world like we shouldn't have been able to know what it looked like in the 16th century or 15th mm. century or whenever that turkish admiral supposedly made those maps and mm. the re the the significance of those maps aside and i don't think they're significant but to put them aside in the book they say piri reese was a 19th century turkish admiral who gave them to the library of congress or something and it's like yeah. you don't even have the times and right and to quote things like i don't know like the book of Dizan, which is essentially just something Madame Blavatsky probably invented to yeah. source from in the secret doctrine, but they quote from that book or they reference that book. Like it actually is a separate book to Blavatsky's writing. So they don't seem to a, they don't understand some of their sources and B they take sources that they probably shouldn't take literally, literally. And then see some of the stuff we don't even know where they're sourcing it from. So right. there's the all of those majority. problems. Yeah, the vast majority, because even some of the stuff so with like the Vril Society and the mm -hmm. uh, the Golden Dawn stuff, some people that like, yes, these were real things, but even their source, but a lot of the source material they're using, a lot of the people that they're talking, just making it up, like like so. That's what I'm saying. Like there, are, there's yes for every one thing that we can say okay this actually happened or this is a true thing that occurred we then have their conclusions after that that's a different thing but the vast majority of the book like you said the stuff that we can track down is just so much of it is just wrong or very misconstrued but again that's on the granular level but again on the thematic level there's a lot of things that are true and again I don't agree with the conclusions, but I think that's why it rings true and why it's held on for so long. Why it's because it's really the inf the influence of the book that's more important than the book itself. Ultimately, is you think like you like we started off at the beginning. Von Daniken read had to have known this book. This came out ten years before it yeah. came out in France. It was huge in Europe. Yeah, you, you're telling me Von Daniken wasn't reading this and wasn't influenced by it, considering. Well, almost all of his much. points are in this book. I mean, as yeah. far as the evidence that he, you know, the the, mm -hmm. the cases he uses, you know, they're 
yeah most of the main ones are in here so there might you could argue i mean you could we could again go back through lovecraft just like they do and we could go back to mm -hmm. don lee and we could go back to theories of atlantis and everything else but as far as putting this in a 20th century mid to late 20th century perspective i think you could make the case that there wouldn't be ancient alien theory without morning of the magicians because you oh, could make yeah. the case that there wouldn't be von daniken's book without morning of the magicians and if there wasn't chariots yeah. of the gods mm -hmm. would it just have appeared in like amazing stories and in yeah. georgia damsky books it, it took that best-selling chariots of the gods which pretty much cribbed from an already european best-selling morning of the magicians to get us yep. to watching mm -hmm. ancient aliens on what channels it on history or whatever the it's history on, right? yes uh which remind actually keep this just some again like this island earth was 1955 when was the quarter mass well it's in, it's uh, english and it started go i think the quarter mass movies go for you know they yeah. range out for over a decade so there's yeah 57. there's the quarter mass experiment and then there's yeah. the other, and then there's quarter mass in the pit and yada 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 you know yeah yeah, yeah. quarter mass uh two was 1957 so to your point, like, would this have, would ancient, again, would ancient astronaut theory be as big as it is today if there wasn't a Von Daniken? Would there have been a Von Daniken if there wasn't a Morning of the Magicians? I think the answer is it would have taken different, it, I think they, these ideas would still be here. It just would have taken a very different form. I think yeah, maybe I there are think themes would, that would I, be different. Yeah, I don't think it, I think it took Chariots of the Gods for some reason that movie, that book just broke along with the movie shortly thereafter and had this incredible cultural yeah. prevalence. I do, I, I think UFO believers would still have ancient astronaut theory in their belief system because it was there as we were talked about last week from, yeah. you know, from amazing stories and before, but yeah without chariots of the gods i can't i mean that was the book that launched it for all intents and purposes right. to the mainstream and i don't think without morning of the magicians i don't think there would be a chariots of the gods well no and i agree with that that's uh, yeah i completely agree that without morning the magicians we don't get chariots of the gods i don't think the theory goes away though i think that i just no. think it would take i do think it would take a very different form though i think there would be very different themes because again uh because Von Daniken's work is so connected to this, you know, to the to uh, to their material with Morning and Magicians, and some of the themes, some of the ideas. I think it just takes a very different form. But I, again, I think I think a lot of the conversations we have today about Nazi occultism and government conspiracy that's all because of this all the popularity yeah, of nazi occultism is because of morning of the magicians this is where that yeah. whole nazi occultism popular idea comes from as well that's a very good point mm -hmm. when people so, start talking about you know nazi flying saucers and the real yeah. society and yeah, you know, the yeah, all, yeah. yeah exactly all of that mm -hmm. stuff is because of the morning of the magicians that's what tr that's yeah. what pushed the button originally to say that the mm -hmm. nazis aren't just a political kind of you know national socialistic fascist movement yeah. beneath that yeah, is a much more important occult underpinnings and that comes straight from berger and pals oh absolutely and that's so yeah that's why so i agree with you we don't get von danigan we don't get i think that this the conversation we're having today becomes looks very very different but i do think that the ideas would still be there because they were there before them Oh yeah, but Charles Ford. They and they talk about Ford as well, of course. Yeah. But Ford was talking exactly. about ancient astronaut stuff, you know. Exactly. So, but I do think again, there's what is it? It's like Alexander Graham Bell was was just the guy who got to the patent office first, right? Certain ideas seem to manifest across oh, yeah. numerous cultures yeah. all at the same time. Um, so, well, any, but, everybody into UFOs before Eric von Daniken wrote Chariots of the Gods, like up and mm -hmm. so, so up to already by 67, anybody who was regularly reading Fate magazine or yeah. reading books by, I don't know, Harold Wilkins or Desmond Leslie or any of the various UFO contactees and a lot of even more mainstream UFO writers already understood ancient astronaut theory. It just wasn't called that yet, but yeah. it wasn't, it just hadn't made the cultural impact outside of UFO belief. So I think it would have stayed in UFO belief i absolutely yeah. agree with that regardless mm -hmm. of morning of the magicians and regardless of chariots of the gods but i don't think 
it took Chariots of the Gods to get it on the bookshelf of almost every house in the suburbs yeah. in the 1970s. And it took yep. Morning of the Magicians in Europe to push Von Daniken's button to make him go after that story. Yeah, I know. And that I completely agree with. I think we can. Yeah, I think we're on the same page with that. And I, I do agree. I think without this book, this the landscape looks very, very different. Now, how different would it be? I don't know. But I but like you said, these are these are the books that popularize these ideas that push these ideas to the forefront that we're having, which allows us to have the conversations we're having today. So this was an amazingly influential book. Um, it's worth the read because, again, it's a fun read. Um, it, it just. 19, 20 year old you is going to read it very differently than 40, 50, 60 year old you is going to read it because and, and it's fair because when you're younger, you you're not as. You know, I was I've yes, I have been around this this stuff for a long time, so it's not like I wasn't aware of it, but at the same time. Uh, when you know, you're still kind of new to a lot of these ideas and these concepts, so it, it reads very, very differently than you know, once you've had them for 20 plus years, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm not high enough to, to believe this right now. Um, so again, great book as always. Like if we ever run across a book or a documentary, we're like, don't watch this. We will tell you. Like we'll straight up tell you. <clears throat> we may have already done that a few episodes ago. I'm not going <laughs> to say which one. But um, yeah, I mean, this one is, again, as always, if for no other reason than just to sort of see, a, you know, how this thing developed from a cultural position. This is a very important book. Um, culturally if not necessarily from a truth perspective or a fact perspective oh yeah i i totally concur with that and if you're 19 and you are reading it for the first time yeah take a take a number of big grains of salt with it don't all of a sudden think you've discovered the secrets of the universe because it's that kind of book that can make you go wow yeah you, you, this is one of those things where you're either going to go to the waffle house or you're going to be reading this book like it to like this is this is that time of your life like i said that's you know you're, you're sitting here reading it and you're like you're 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 your trunk maybe your friends are high and you're like can but do two hands ever really touch you know <laughs> your friends over there eating the stale chips that you that you have behind <laughs> in the refrigerator and, he, and he's facing the wall and you're like yeah that's just what randy does you know <laughs> Like that's, that's when, like, that's when you read this book and it blows your mind. Then you're an adult and you go through it and you're like, no, nah, just no, but it is culturally important as we've discussed. And so it's always good to know where you, you have to know where you've been to know where you're going. And that's also a theme of this book that I think, again, that's why it is arch like, like Dean so beautifully put it's archetypically true, if not factually true. Well, Dean, sign us out of here. I guess on that cheery note, I'd just like to tell everybody thank you for watching and or listening, depending how you're consuming us on the Untold Radio Network. If you are or you have any advice for us or you want to leave any feedback or you want to leave us something we might even play on the show, go to the untoldradioam.com webpage and just scroll down below the show icons and you can record a voice message. We haven't, we haven't played a voice message from anybody yet. I would love to, that would be so much fun yeah. and subscribe like all the other good stuff. And until we catch you next week on the same mysterious channel at the same mysterious time, Keep it weird. We'll get you behind the card catalog. <laughs>